Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what uh, we try to develop here at Okin. So Okin is a, a new startup company that is based in Paris and in New York, and uh, we develop uh, machine learning technologies uh, for the future of uh, medicine and uh, drug discovery. Um, previous to founding Okin, I used to be an, uh, an academic as well, an assistant professor in machine learning at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure, and my co-founder is a uh, an oncologist, so it's a, a medical doctor, and he's a, a specialist uh, of uh, predictive model in oncology as well. So I want to start the, the presentation by a very recent uh, news. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, uh, if you heard about uh, this news uh, last week. Uh, okay, yeah, J just last week. Uh, it's uh, an FDA statement about uh, a drug that has been approved. You may say, well, who cares? It's a new drug, it's cool. Uh, but this time, it's different. Uh, it's about a drug uh, in the field of immunotherapy. Okay? So immunotherapy is a way to fight cancer by modifying the immune system of the people who, are, who had cancer so that its own immune system can fight the cancer. Okay? So it's a very, uh, very smart and very, very powerful way to try to fight cancer. And in 2012, it, it was the, the, the one of the biggest moves in oncology in the, in the last decades. They showed that uh, immunotherapy can actually work for melanoma, for people who had a certain mutation. And it opened the way to a new kind of uh, a way to treat cancers. And that's actually a huge effort in research from academic labs and very big uh, pharmaceutical companies. And what happened last week is that th this drug from uh, lab laboratory Merck, basically they were approved for a specific subtype of cancer, say lung cancer, lung cancer for instance. And then they have to try and do clinical trial and say, okay, well, does it work to another subtype of cancer and another subtype of cancer, etc. And they want to see how the drug would work. Why is that? It's because their drug is working for about like, uh, I would say, 20% of people, okay? It's giving side effects to a few percent of people that can kill them. And we don't know which are the people uh, for which it's going to work, okay? We don't know which are the people who are going to suffer side effects. And it's a big problem because it can help a lot of people, but we don't know who. So the FDA, the FDA decided that, uh, uh, okay, they have this kind of clue that it may work for many, many different types of cancer, provided you have a specific type of mutation patterns in the, in the genome of the tumor. And they decided that this drug would be av available to everyone who has this type of mutation, regardless the subtype of cancer. It means that we are moving from a world where drugs are uh, specified to an indication, a disease that we want to treat, but are now specified to a specific mutational pattern, a specific descriptor of the patient uh, that is not uh, attached to a specific disease. Okay? And this is, uh, uh, this is a major event in the, in the history of the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, it's a new way to try drugs and, and, and to understand who are, who, the, who are the people who are going to benefit from them. So this is for the, 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 the introduction. And now I'm going to explain you uh, in this context what we are trying to do at Oki in, in a, a very general way because things can uh, be very uh, complex in te technically. So basically, if you look at the uh, research and development returns in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, it follows an inverted Moore law. The more we uh, advance, the less is, are the returns, and it goes on the logarithmic scales. All the low-hanging fruit drugs that works for everyone are now gone, okay? And now we are left with very complex disease, such as cancer, chronic disease, and aging uh, related disease, for, in, for instance. And for, to, to fight this disease, we will need to go deeper in the details and understand all these predictive markers that are associated with new ideas. 
I have a new idea of a drug, but who are going to be uh, the people that, on which it's going to be effective? And if we want to, if we want to answer this, this very, very important question, then we need to uh, uh, see what's happening around us. We need to see that there is this, these two major forces that are completely transforming a lot of industries. That is the availability of a lot of data due to the digital re revolution, and in particular, now uh, m many, many hospitals are fully digitalized and all the uh, uh, medical records are in electronic format. And this uh, wave here of uh, uh, data that is available is meeting the artificial intelligence uh, technologies that can, uh, uh, all these algorithms that can exploit this data. And this will produce a lot of predictive models on how the drug works and on who is going to be uh, working the better. But here we have a big problem in the healthcare industry is that data is spread across many, many places and data sharing between different actors is very, very complex. If you, uh, uh, if you ask hospitals and patients to put on their data on the cloud, it's a very beautiful idea, but it's not going to happen for many, many years, okay? And we need to start to work in this uh, fragmented environment where every hospital wants to keep its data for the sake of patient privacy, which is very important. So I'm going to show you uh, uh, in this context how we think uh, that uh, machine learning technologies will impact the future of this, uh, uh, of this process. Uh, I'm not going to focus on every step, just on two of them, but just to give you our, our vision, is that uh, uh, you have three main uh, blocks that are very important and that are going to be impacted a lot by uh, these new technologies. The first one is drug design. It's a very uh, uh, um, a specific problem. How do you design a molecule that would bind to a specific target, to a, sp a specific protein for uh, which you want to uh, design a drug? And uh, here we are seeing a lot of new uh, technologies in, in deep, deep learning in particular that are challenging the uh, gold standard of uh, physical modeling where you try to emulate the law of, of uh, uh, quantum physics. And it's, it's, it's starting to work, and it works much faster with higher uh, accuracy rate, so that uh, now uh, we can envision a future where uh, processes that can last uh, many years and cost hundred millions of dollars in uh, chemistry experiments can boil down to a few weeks or a few months of work. And so the, 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 the cost reduction will be huge, and it, it provides a way to test many, many more drugs. Then if you have a good candidate of drug, you need to test it in clinical trial. And here, uh, to test it in clinical trial, you need to have a smart way to identify what are the subgroup of people that will rep respond the better to your drug. And here, uh, uh, machine learning will do a lot of, uh, will have a lot of impact. And finally, how do you manage and how do you handle all this data that is accumulated every day in uh, uh, GP practices, in hospitals, everywhere, not to mention uh, IOTs and wearables, etc. And all this data combined with the fact that you know that this guy is taking this drug and has this effect is something that is very powerful to understand how drugs are working on our body and how we can improve them. So just going uh, to give you a glimpse into what uh, we can do in, in, the, in the clinical trial field and in the real world evidence field. Um, so there are s several problems we can ask. First one is to say, you uh, design a drug, you have three phases. First one, you test safety on, on, uh, on, uh, on people to see if it's uh, not too toxic. And then you, you try the phase two, you try your, your drug with different doses so that you select the best dose. And uh, right now, there is not really much effort put on how we can uh, learn from this data that is accumulating through the different phases to uh, predict who is going to respond well to a treatment and how we can optimize the last phase of the clinical trial uh, uh, so that we maximize the, the likelihood of success. Here you have to know that going through all this process of the three phases is something that may cost up to a billion dollars. Okay? And, and uh, uh, failure rates are very high, like uh, one out of two drugs fail in, in, in phase three 
even, even if it was working in phase one and two. So there are many, many challenges. And if we can improve this process, find the right subgroups, it will be a huge, it will have a huge impact and it will accelerate how new drugs are put in the market. We can also analyze phase three that failed to uh, understand what are the right subgroup of patients that respond well to the patient, we build predictive model and, and do other uh, phase three uh, trials. And here, uh, uh, it's just uh, 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 to summarize here, we, th we believe that there are many, many different challenges. So uh, uh, part of the challenges is what we call heterogeneity between uh, uh, the different phases of the trial. I will not go here in the detail, but here is an example of uh, what we've done uh, with a, a pharmaceutical company. And uh, uh, basically, it was a, a proof of concept where we worked on two trials. And uh, each time they ask us, uh, can you uh, improve the selection of patients for phase three uh, so that we have a, a lower p-value, so that we have a higher, uh, a, a more significant difference between the group that received the drug and the group that received the placebo. And uh, uh, each time we demonstrate that using uh, machine learning technologies, you can really make a difference on, on, on real uh, data for trials that really failed and they lost uh, a lot of money on that. So this is something that, that, that worked and is really encouraging. Uh, so second point is how we can uh, 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 integrate and how can we extract meaningful information coming from real world uh, data so that uh, we can have even more insights about how to select the right patient, how to find predictive biomarkers. And basically, we uh, need to work with many different types of data. Uh, we need to have an approach that is uh, integrative because the description of a patient right now, it's a lot of different uh, types of data. It can be uh, patient records, meaning all the consultation records, all the uh, stuff that your doctor is writing in free text, so natural language, uh, all that comes from uh, reports from surgery, etc. It can be medical images coming from radiology, but also pathology images, histology. So these are microscope photographs uh, of uh, tissue, and also all types of bi biological measurement. Uh, it can be uh, classical blood test, but also genetics and things like that, which brings billions of variables for each patient. Um, and it's really challenging to integrate to have a technology that integrates these different types of data. And I think that today, no one is really able to integrate that. Uh, but clearly, deep learning is really interesting because it provides a way to handle unstructured data, such as images and texts. And you can use other uh, machine learning approach to handle uh, uh, structured data. And it, it is starting to give good results. So, here you have uh, uh, a schematic example. You have uh, in the hospital, you have people that respond well to a treatment, for instance, uh, chemotherapy, and so some people who have very bad experiences and for which the treatment don't work at all, uh, and, and they can have uh, toxicity effects. So if you are able to identify those people uh, in the hospital and look at all the data that was accumulated through their uh, clinical pathway in the hospital, then you are able to train a, a machine learning algorithm to predict uh, if the patient is going to have a good response or a bad response. Uh, then you can uh, evaluate your model on new patients to see if it works well in the out of validation, out of sample validation. And more importantly, you can look at how your model is extracting information for the patients to, uh, to make the prediction and make a combination of uh, DNA, uh, uh, gene expression, demographic variables, etc. And here, uh, clearly there is a, a, a big uh, challenge is uh, what uh, Nikos just talked about uh, right before, is the, the black box problem. And uh, we believe this is a problem, but we also believe that it's possible to work out solutions and in the, in, in the future to overcome the black box problem. And there are already, uh, there are already very interesting uh, and promising uh, uh, ideas on, on, on this question. And, and this is interpretability of machine learning algorithm is one of the biggest challenge ahead for many different applications. And here, I just want to, uh, uh, to, to come back to the problem of data sharing uh, before, uh, uh, before the end of my presentation. As we said, is data sharing is a big problem. 
if we want to uh, 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 gather a sufficient amount of data to solve a particular question, sometimes we think the only solution will be to ask many different uh, uh, partners, many different hospitals, if we can aggreg aggregate the data in a single place. Uh, for instance, in our uh, cloud or, or uh, in, in a third party place. This is very difficult in practice and this is one of the biggest bottlenecks nowadays to access large scale data in healthcare. And many very important people such as Joe Biden in the US, they are all uh, every day advocating for more and more data sharing and it's been decades that people are talking about that. But if you look at concrete example of what is happening today, not much, really not much, and we can still wait for a long time, I think, before it happens because of many, many reasons. Although it's something that we wish for uh, a lot. So what we think is that uh, there are technological solutions to overcome this problem and to circumvent it. And the idea is that you can train algorithms in different places and the algorithm can continue its learning process, okay? so you let the data stay put in different places and you make only the algorithms traveling from places to places. And if you do that, you can achieve almost the same level of, uh, of accuracy, of precision, as if you just gather all the data in the same place. And uh, this, is the, this is the basic idea of, the, uh, of what we call it here at Okin, collaborative artificial intelligence is the idea that many, many contributors in uh, various hospitals across the world can uh, create predictive models, machine learning algorithms, using their own data by empowering the user with the appropriate tools uh, on specific uh, uh, projects where technology is uh, mature, for instance, for vision. Uh, and then uh, we can uh, make all these algorithms talk to each other, exchange their secrets, and becomes better and better without the need, the need to put all the data in the same place. So that at the end, the end user who is going to need the prediction can have always the best prediction possible. And each time a new user has an idea of a new project, a new prediction project, it improves the uh, uh, overall AI. And so it's a new type of AI, uh, an AI where we don't start from a white page each time we start a new project. But it's an AI where we can transfer learning uh, from one project to the other so that it becomes more and more uh, powerful. And uh, doing that uh, without uh, data sharing is a, a very exciting project. Uh, and we believe it can have a lot of impact for the whole uh, healthcare industry. And we believe that uh, it can produce a lot of very useful uh, predictive biomarkers to predict the effect of drugs and better identify who are the people, who are, who are the patients that are going to benefit most from this very new and very new, uh, very, very promising uh, way of treating uh, cancer. Thank you for your attention. Gilles, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another fascinating view of AI. Um, Questions to the room? I have a, a quick question, very pragmatical, very uh, pragmatic question. Um, the, uh, with regards to the data today, the, the ones that we've gathered at, so far, is it sufficient to be able to, be, uh, to have a real impact, especially on the medical field, or do we need to get additional data that we don't yet have in terms of data collection? I'm not talking about the treatment or the platform that you're setting up. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of data, I think there is already a lot of data that has been accumulated over uh, the years. We have, for instance, uh, uh, signed a partnership with uh, Institut Curie, uh, which is one of the leaders, leader uh, in, in the field of cancer uh, in Europe. And they have a huge database with hundreds of thousands of uh, cases, uh, with electronic medical records, images, and stuff. The thing is that they are not working on it, so we help them work on it. On, on the other hand, although there is a lot of data already available, we are still missing some types of data and a, at a large scale, and in particular, uh, genetic data. So genetic data is very important 
if we want to understand how, uh, uh, how biology works. Uh, and for now, no one has really like a uh, very large scale, uh, one million people uh, whole genome sequencing <coughs> with all different types of annotations about the drugs, etc., etc. Okay. So this is something that needs to be built. Uh, but we think it's going to be built just by experience, just by how the patients are going to the hospital. And you don't need to fund a special project for that. Yeah. Okay, the data is being collected. Do we have questions from the room? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Hashil, for your presentation. I just had a question about the data you have so much difficulty to, to, to get. Um, are they, they, why do the hospitals uh, afraid about uh, pri uh, privacy since, since you, you just need anonymous data? So th that's a good question. Uh, some, that, some part of the data can be anonymized but a lot of them is very, very hard to anonymize. If you think, for instance, about electronic medical records, where your doctor is writing stuff about what happened to you, then it's very difficult, it's text, okay? And even if I replace your name by uh, some token, I can still find a way to identify you, probably. And, and uh, the CNIL is very, very strict on that, and the idea is that if I can identify you, then it's not, it's not anonymized. So for instance, uh, if your husband has a copy of a, a, radio, a radiological exam from, from you, okay, and that I have access to another radiological exam, then he can ask me whether you went to the hospital because we can compare the, the, the images. So even data that we think is completely anonymized. In fact, if you, if you dig deeper and if you are like a pri private detective, you can find who is uh, behind. So okay. We're going to take one last question in the audience. Okay, it's a question on the business model, um, maybe uh, in reference to the ownership of the data. Uh, who's going to pay for what? The owner of the data or the rent your algorithms? How do you make money? Okay, so th that's a very interesting question. So basically what, what we try to do is something that is uh, going to be widespread in many hospitals and we want to empower the doctors to create algorithms using our tools with a, a shared propriety, meaning that uh, uh, they put their part, which is the data and the expert knowledge, and we put our part, which is the artificial intelligence algorithm. Uh, so we want to be some, something that's fair, okay? So what is produced at the platform will be shared between the people who has the expertise and the data and us. Uh, and then uh, the people uh, we, we think who are going to be the most interested into what is discovered in this data comes from the pharmaceutical industry, okay? And these are the ones that are going to uh, help us uh, finance this whole system. Great, Eugene, thank you very, very much. You thank stay you on much. for the cocktail, the answer some yeah. questions. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you.